thank you all. Uh, let's say thanks to uh, Tom Central for the wonderful music uh, intro. Uh, yeah, he, he always does this every first Thursday. We've got one more in June uh, coming up, so show up early and enjoy uh, and, and enjoy Tom's music. Uh, it's great. Plays us in. So music for the ears, um, and then we get some some music for the, uh, or some uh, some words of wisdom for our brain right afterwards. Uh, so today uh, we want to say thank you as well to our friends in the Wakamal Library. As always, uh, they, they're friendly to us. They support this program uh, and all our other programs, uh, team programs, children's programs. So they keep us keep us going. And so really want to say. Uh, Thank you to them. We're grateful for all they do, our volunteers, and, uh, and uh, they, they really help us out and make all these things possible. So if you're not a member of our friends group, uh, please consider joining. And I know they have their uh, home tour coming up, so that, that should be their garden tour, rather, uh, coming up. That should be, uh, it's perfect weather, should be something great to see. Uh, so. Uh, check that out. It's online at the Friends of the Wakma Library website. Uh, you can see that. And, uh, and go uh, join and have a, a great view of some, some area, neighborhood uh, gardens and get inspired. Our speaker today, by the way, is kind of a, a master gardener in her own right. So, uh, th that's just yeah, I'm sort sorry of, I'm going to miss it. It sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to see the gardens at Pauly's Island. It's a, a side gig of hers. She does a lot of other things too, but one of her many side gigs. That, uh, that didn't actually even make it into the official bio. <laughs> this is Dr. Kendra Hamilton, um, and we're thrilled to have her. Uh, she is a Charleston native with Gullah ancestry and an award-winning writer who has been featured on C-SPAN and NPR, among other places. Dr. Hamilton earned her doctorate from the University of Virginia. She's Associate Professor of English and Director of Southern Studies at Presbyterian College, uh, up, up the way a little bit, uh, in Clinton, South Carolina. She has served as a Cave Canon Fellow and which is a great honor, and as a board member of the South Carolina Academy of Authors. She is the author of the poetry collection, The Goddess of Gumbo, <laughs> Word Poetry, 2016. Um, so that's, you know, she's a she works on, on both sides of the aisle, <laughs> creative writing and a scholar. Today she will discuss the fascinating history of the cultural struggle surrounding the publication performance recording of Gullah Spirituals. Her talk is drawn from her exciting upcoming book, Romancing the Gullah, which will be out from the University of Georgia Press uh, come April of next year. So it's, it's rolling forward. And that, that should be a wonderful book, I'm sure. A lot of us will be very interested. And maybe you'll have me back. Yeah, maybe, yeah we're, we're getting a preview. So, uh, we, we, can, uh, we can get the book in hand uh, come next year, maybe for the garden tour. And you can talk about gardening. As well. <laughs> but it explores the way Gullah heritage has been represented, sometimes misrepresented, in popular culture. So please warmly welcome our friend, Dr. Kendra Hamilton. Daniel, uh, thank you for having me. Um, thank you, uh, Tom and Truman, for you know uh, Tom for entertaining me while I was getting set up, and Truman for getting me set up. And thank you for everyone coming today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to come to Polly's Island, and what a darling library you guys have. Um, you don't know this, Daniel, but I grew up in the library. My mother was a librarian, so between her library at school and the Charleston County Library, my entire childhood was spent on the floor in the stacks <laughs> reading, waiting for my mother to get off of work. So, so um, uh, just a little bit more. I was trained uh, in American Studies at, uh, at University of Virginia, and uh, the people who, who trained me, we were all about place-based um, inquiry and place-based studies. 
And so that matched very much with my own interests. And um, so I have some wonderful people that, that I learned from. Uh, here in South Carolina, the work that I do is around the Low Country, which is you know the place of my birth and uh, a place that I've uh, always been fascinated with. Uh, but also I write uh, and, and teach about uh, the textile mill communities of the upstate. Um, I established the, uh, the textile mill archive at Presbyterian College. We have collected oral histories and a variety of other materials to sort of uh, document that side of, of Southern culture also. So I think between the two, we cover all the bases in terms of uh, past that is uh, either misrepresented or just simply unknown um, in South Carolina. So um, I'm gonna start out by playing just a little bit of song for you guys, and I hope we've got our volume straight. <laughs> Sorry, go back. One more time. Gracie Gadsden of St. Helena Island. Um, she was performing one of the songs of her childhood, sorry, started over again, one of the songs from her childhood for, uh, for uh, John and Alan Lomax um, many decades ago. So the first slide is just about the, the, the Killing Fields and Healing Fields sorrow songs and contested grounds. These are the four concepts that the talk is organized around. And I find these ideas a provocative reframing for the place that we have long known as the Carolina Low Country. Um, the Carolina Low Country, which has always been draped in this golden haze of nostalgia, um, of, we should call it imperial nostalgia. And when, well, let me just unpack that for you. When we talk about, you know, everybody knows what nostalgia is, it's that longing for you know, the old days, the things that we miss from the past. In, when scholars use the term imperial nostalgia, what we're talking about is um, nostalgia for something that one has been complicit in destroying. Like you uh, mow down uh, in a forest to put up a Walmart, and everybody um, you know, goes and shops at Walmart, but they you know, mourn the fact that the birds are gone and, you know, that they, they, they don't see those trees when they drive by anymore. Or you uh, exterminate the Indians, but everyone goes crazy over the last of the Mo Mohicans. So it's, that, it's a way of kind of like having it both ways, right? But that supports the status quo. So this um, name, the Carolina Low Country and the haze that it evokes, cloak the reality that we are standing on the ancestral lands of the Waccamaw, the Siwi, the PD, the Chikora, the Edisto, the Etowan, the Kiowa, the Yamasee, and other names that are more familiar to us like the Chickasaw, the Creek, the Apalachicola, the Seminole, and so many more. This framing allows us to celebrate the plantation lifestyle as one of beauty and ease while conveniently just sort of like slipping past that whole nasty stuff about the basis of that lifestyle and brutality in coercion um, and in removal of, of peoples from their homes. These lands have another name now, one that's familiar to you. 
They were reclaimed uh, in a process from 2004 through 2006 in an explicit act of cultural healing that involved local communities, non-governmental and governmental preservation organizations, and both houses of Congress. So this was a big, you know, a, a, a grassroots effort that became very, very large and embraced everyone. That process rechristened the area the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. My talk embraces these contested grounds and reflects my interest in their distinctive sounds of the language that people speak, the, the, the spirituals, the jubilees, the field hollers, the work songs, the lullabies that they sang, all of which form an essential part of our region's contribution to the cultural heritage of the United States. I am far from being the only person who has been drawn to this history and these sounds, though, so my talk will specifically explore a little-known history of contestation between figures associated with the Harlem and the Charleston Renaissance over the provenance and the ownership of this material. We'll start with this man. This is W.E.B. Du Bois, um, uh, an American sociologist, historian, author, editor, and activist who was one of the most important public intellectuals of the 20th century. He co-founded the NAACP in 1909 and edited its magazine, The Crisis, from 1919 to 1934. His collection of essays, The Souls of Black Folks, is a landmark of American literature, and his Black Reconstruction in 1934, which basically told the story of the Reconstruction period, you, uh, with the novel, <laughs> the then novel notion of including black voices and black perspectives in the story that was told, um, laid the foundation for a, an, a whole paradigm shift in historiography starting in the 1960s. So you don't get a Eugene Genovese or a Peter Wood or a Charles Joyner or an Eric Foner if any of those uh, names are familiar to you from your readings in history. You don't get those men without this man. He says of the spirituals, little of beauty has America given the world save the rude grandeur God himself stamped on her bosom. That gives you the, the style of it. He uses grand Victorian rolling phrases. The human spirit in this new world has expressed itself in vigor and ingenuity rather than in beauty. And so by faithful chance, the Negro folk song, the rhythmic cry of the slave stands today not simply as the sole American music, but as the most beautiful expression of human experience born this side of the seas. It has been neglected, it has been and is half despised, and above all, it has been persistently mistaken and misunderstood. But notwithstanding, it still remains as the singular spiritual heritage of the nation and the greatest gift of the Negro people. Standing so in opposition to Du Bois is this group of people. Um, the SPNS, the Society for the Preservation of Negro Spirituals, later shortened to Society for Preservation of Spirituals. These were the cultural leaders of the Charleston Renaissance. Um, uh, and they were um, not just a whites only group, but you had to be born on a plantation to belong to this group. So it was, um, a form of cultural exclusivity in addition to racial exclusivity that sort of defined what the Society for the Preservation of Spirituals were about. They also explicitly denied membership to anybody who was a trained musician because they wanted to uh, capture that natural spontaneity and they didn't want any influence from European forms. Um, they uh, set themselves up without a trace of irony as the protector of the Negro spirituals and the only qualified or worthy interpreters of their legacy. So this quote is from Panchita Hayward Grimble uh, from the inaugural performance of the society when they are, though the image is not from their inaugural performance. So in their, the, an interesting note, they always performed in ball dress, right? The women would always wear ball gowns. The men would always wear tuxedos. They never performed in black space, blackface. They were trying very much to separate themselves from that sort of pop culture tradition. This was an elite performance 
usually for elite audiences, and um, this is how they describe what they were doing. Our purpose is to preserve the songs that were sung in slavery days and the 25 years immediately following in the Carolina coast country. Songs that possessed as much as possible of the pure African wildness and beauty of tone, only touched by the religion of the Anglo-Saxon, not as the Negro of today sings the Baptist, Methodist, and Episcopal hymns, merely buried by the African love of syncopation. So, so, so they're uh, on a sort of rescue mission. You know, we are going to preserve the purest African form that we can find, ironically, this pure white organization. It's, you know, it's kind of funny, actually, when you think about it, right? So um, offering yet another view is uh, this woman. This is Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, she pioneered methods in, of embedding with informants that are now standard in the field of anthropology, even though they were uh, very much um, you know, little known at that time. Uh, she's also the foremother of all black women's writing since the 1970s and since her re rediscovery in the 1970s. And um, she, so she's a fascinating figure, and if you haven't read uh, any Zora Neale Hurston, you need to start with Their Eyes Were Watching God, and then kind of go on from there. She's a, a wonderful uh, woman. And in her typical iconoclastic style, uh, Hurston leveled her rhetorical guns at both sides of the debate. She says, the, other, the idea that the whole body of spirituals are sorrow songs is ridiculous. They cover a wide range of subjects, from a peeve at gossipers to death and judgment. There never has been a presentation of genuine Negro spirituals to any audience anywhere. I mean, she's definite, right? She's, you, she's very clear. Um, what is being sung by the concert artists and glee clubs are the works of Negro composers or adapters based on the spirituals. They have spread their interpretation over America and Europe, but with all the glee clubs and soloists, there has not been one genuine spiritual presented. So her position seems to be sort of on the side of the Charleston Renaissance. And so we're gonna have some fun unpacking what all these people were up to. But first, um, uh, since Goa Geechee culture is one that has been for so many years kind of mystified and mythified and thoroughly mischaracterized by propagandists and hack writers and racist scholarship, since it's only now in the present that we have begun to have reliable scholarship on the evidence and even words for the Atlantic Creole encounter that forged this culture, I think a little bit more background is in order before we proceed. Now some of you are gonna be familiar with what I have, you know, what I'm gonna present in these next few slides. Some of you are not, so I hope you will bear with me if you already know this. Um, so we're gonna distill what has been, what was a debate of more than a century in just like that. So also bear with me on that. This quote is from Ambrose Gonzalez, who is a, a sort of a, a, a part of that group of Negro folk collectors from the early uh, 20th century. The Gonzalez brothers were uh, founded the state newspaper, and Ambrose Gonzalez was a well-known collector as well as the editorialist of, 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 of shall we say, pro, the pro-Confederate uh, cause in, <laughs> in South Carolina. So this is how he characterized Gullah Geechee's speech. Slovenly and careless of speech, these Gullahs seized upon the peasant English used by some of the early colonists and by the white servants of the wealthier colonists, wrapped their clumsy tongues about it as well as they could, and enriched with certain expressive African words, it issued through their flat noses and thick lips. That was, you know, that was normal, right? <laughs> This is Lorenzo uh, D. Turner, who is, um, he was an English professor at Howard University, but also a linguist, one of the only linguists of, of, of that period to actually go to Africa and compare speech in South Carolina with speech in Sierra Leone, which was the source of many of the people who, were, uh, who came to the Americas. And in his, I keep knocking this thing, <laughs> shaking this thing and it moves ahead. 
In his um, court, this uh, is from his correspondence, and later it finds its way into his landmark book, Africanisms in the Gullah dialect. Up to the present time, I have found in the vocabulary of Negroes in coastal South Carolina and Georgia approximately 4,000 West African words, besides many survivals in syntax, inflections of sounds, and intonation. I have recorded in Georgia a few songs which are entirely African. So, out of Africa. Gullah Geechee culture is out of Africa. The, there was a debate of more than a century over precisely this question of where the words Gullah and Geechee come from. And so here I'm showing you a map of the uh, section of uh, West African and West Central African coast that uh, the majority of the, uh, the, the peoples who were brought to the New World, to South Carolina, uh, came from. We should remember that you see Senegambia and Gambia and Sierra Leone up at the top. That region is known as the Senegambia, and it really it refers to the Senegal and Gambia rivers. Those were the rice-growing regions of West Africa where the rice technology uh, that, that was used in the Low Country using tidal rivers uh, comes from. And then below that, uh, outside of, of uh, um, uh, where we see Malembo and Kabenda, Loango, Luanda, the kingdom of the Congo. So that's Congo, Key Congo, and uh, also Angola, which gives us the name of the nation Angola. So go, there's a Gola tribe, G-O-L-A tribe, from the Santa Gambia, and also a Gola, Angola, Angola tribe from the Congo. So this is a sort of, because there are Gola people and Angola people, this is where scholars believe Goa came from. Also, in the Senegambia region, there are tribes called the Kisi and also the Jiji. So these tribes are believed to bring the, you know, uh, that word Gichi into our into the English language. The thing to remember is that of people who came to the New World to South Carolina, nearly 40% were from the Senegambia and Sierra Leone. And another 40% were from the Congo region, including Angola. So <laughs> those were 80% of the people who came to South Carolina from Africa. The rest came from all these other regions. This part, Dahomey and Asante, uh, that is the home of someone I'm going to mention later on in our talk of Lauda Echiano. And, and but this, uh, this is a region that I should, uh, I should make clear is about the length of the U.S.-Mexico border, right? It's a tremendous expanse of territory. And um, some people came from all the way to the other side of the African continent. Some people came from Madagascar, only like 1%, right? Madagascar and Mozambique. That is a distance from, say, North Carolina to Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. So the scope of the trade is tremendous. I'm just trying to put that into your heads. So yeah. The other thing to remember is that Gullah Geechee culture is rice culture. And this is an image of um, uh, modern rice, Oriza sativa, in its panicle forming phase, right when it starts to make those grains that are the thing that we, in, um, that we eat here today in, the, um, in, in South Carolina and Georgia. Uh, everybody from uh, the, the saying that used to be common when I was a kid was, you ain't nothing but a rice-eating Geechee, you know? So that's what people from other places would say to black people from South Carolina, because they didn't eat rice. So they're like, what is up with the rice? Rice is an African survival. Well, sugar, tobacco, and coffee are the commodities most associated with the spread of enslavement in the Americas. Um, uh, and in and America's enmeshment in global networks of exchange, the commodity that brought wealth to lower South Carolina and Georgia, and also upper Florida, basically the entire coastal plain from Cape Fear in North Carolina to the St. Johns River in Jacksonville was rice. This was a commodity with which the Europeans were completely unfamiliar, but which they were happy to take credit for um, bringing it to the United States. The joke is, the local joke, and I'm sure you can hear this today if you take certain uh, tours uh, in, in the Charleston Historic District. Why are Charlestonians like the cheesy Chinese? The answer, because they eat rice and worship their ancestors. Well, actually, we eat rice because people from West Africa 
the West African Rice Center, as we can see from this map of the diaspora of rice from old world to new, people from that West African Rice Center um, came to South Carolina. And so look at the arrows. Those are all the places where the primary staple is rice, right? In other, like for example, think about La La South Carolina. The staple on the coast is rice. The staple where I live now is corn. Everybody eats cornbread. Everybody eats grits. You know, it's corn in some way, shape, or form. Rice is, well, people don't even know how to cook it, really. They're like, how do you cook rice again? And they're always coming to me and saying, okay, one more time, let me go through it. So, um, yeah, so these um, fabrications, such as the, you know, Chinese connection, um, have been, uh, you know, since it, as early as the 1970s, these were brought into doubt by people like Peter Wood in his Black Majority, um, and Charles Joyner in Downs by the Riverside. Um, but uh, this, their hypothesis was proven about two decades ago by Judith Carney's Black Rice, which showed that the methods, the materials, and even the tools used to grow rice in South Carolina were both distinct from those in Asia and identical to those used in West Africa. So it's now widely understood that the commodity itself and the modes of production were expropriated from West Africa along with the workforce. So basically, uh, the men and women from the so-called rice coast of West Africa, whose descendants in the New World became the Creole people we now know as Gullah Geechee, were kidnapped from their homelands for their advanced technology. Right? This is the workforce that we have been told was ignorant and brought no, and had no past and had nothing to contribute to the American, um, you know, uh, condition. This, of course, is not how the, the story is traditionally told. Um, so, in the way the story is traditionally told during the period of the Charleston Renaissance, is of this image at the top. I guess that's your right. <laughs> the top right. That's Alice Ravenel Hugh G. Smith. Uh, an image from her uh, rice, um, her rice series, a Carolina uh, rice plantation in the 50s. She meant 1850s, which was her signature work of the sort of you know high water mark of, uh, of a career of making beautiful images of, of historic Charleston. Um, at the bottom left, we have the Society for the Preservation of Spirit Spirituals once again, and also the Poetry uh, Society of South Carolina which was founded by DuBose Hayward, um, author of Porgy, co-founded by him. And there was a lot of sort of like cross. The Carolina Etchers Club was Alice Ravenel Hugh G. Smith's uh, organization, and the SPS and the PSSC, there's a lot of sort of cross-fertilization among these uh, organizations. A lot of the same people belonged to the different, to different ones. But um, the, there, uh, it seems to be that around this time, in the 1920s or so, when these uh, this so-called Renaissance was starting to coalesce, uh, Charleston uh, came to a realization that in the absence of rice as a marketable commodity uh, and the failure to sort of create an industrial, uh, you know, uh, an industrial base that would allow uh, the city to replenish its wealth, the most marketable commodity the city had was itself. So they began to create a story about Charleston, a story about the South that became compelling and that began to bring tourists in droves. And so all Rice <coughs> and Gullah people are central to that story that they're starting to tell. And that in, this, in this story, um, Charleston and the coast figure as a pastoral paradise so I'm going to go back to that quote that was at the beginning, uh, and this quote was by uh, Herbert Ravenel Sass, who was Alice Ravenel Hugh G. Smith's cousin, and who was uh, a writer who provided the text for all of her, uh, her work. He writes, and this is in from the Carolina Low Country, uh, the signature work of the Carolina of the um, of the Charleston Renaissance. Uh, it's a book that combines uh, uh, essays. Uh, visual art, and even the songs that they have selected out, the SPS has selected out as most worthy of preservation. 
He writes, even the most searching critic of the two romantic plantation, tra plantation tradition admits that Lower South Carolina was the one district where an order of life existed which really approximated the glowing picture painted by the story writers. The old plantation houses, the old parish churches deep in the woods, the old gardens, the stately avenues of hoary live oaks, the wide rice fields abandoned down to rushes and water lilies and yellow lotus, all these whispered tales of great days that were once lived here. All these are memorials, monuments of that golden age which ended more than three score years ago, but which somehow still lives on because the spell of it, the tradition of it has left lies, the, the, the tradition it has left lies like an invisible mist over this whole region and invests it with a charm that takes stronger and stronger hold upon one's consciousness. He goes on and on and on. <laughs> He's written a lot of stuff in this vein. That spell lingers, you know, almost 100 years after he wrote those words, right? So they did manage to create a really powerful um, image or, uh, or feeling about Charleston that has that the, you know, the powers that be in the Tourist and Convention Bureau are still, you know, pumping for those dollars, you know, many, many years after that was established. <coughs> uh, it should be pointed out, though, that Sass's invocation of the pastoral mode, I mean, it's a powerful example, exemplar of what we mean by imperialist nostalgia, right? Because it erases all the labor that was required uh, to, to create this plantation complex. And there could be no neater illustration of Raymond Williams' contention that the pastoral mode uh, and its evocation of a lost rural paradise functions only if one disappears labor altogether. There, um, um, there are countless uh, images of the butterfly lakes at Milton Place Gardens. Sometimes it's mentioned that these are part of the hydraulic system of dikes and sluice gates and canals upon which the rice operation depended. Almost never do we hear that the labor required to remake the coastal plain for rice cultivation uh, can be equated with the effort required to build the pyramids. Mm -hmm. And imagine that building the pyramids was something that took place over centuries. The rice plain, um, the coastal plain of the south, the southeastern Atlantic, was remade in a, in a, in a, you know, really in about 75 years. So, so think about that. Just put that in the back of your minds. Similarly, uh, Wendell Berry, some of you may be uh, familiar with his work. He reminds us in The Hidden Wound that this cloying romanticism that so much of you know, pastoral uh, romance uses is the method by which violence against land, and especially people, is made to vanish. Uh, very few tours mention the fact that the Lowcountry landscape sass is so eager to invest with sanctity was in fact a killing field. Only 5% of US slaves were associated with rice cultivation in 1850 the period during which rice ruled the coasts of South Carolina and Georgia, just as short stable cotton, worked by 73% of the total enslaved population, ruled the interior and the deep south. But rice was consistently associated with the highest probability of death. Among infants, the probability of death was 41% higher than the combined probabilities for cotton, hemp, tobacco, or sugar cultivation. Among those aged uh, 5 to 14, death probabilities rose to 287%. Right? It was because, well, I'll go on. <laughs> Slave mortality rates were even higher in the overcrowded conditions of cities like Charleston and Savannah. Indeed, the seasonal cycle of epidemics from malaria to yellow fever to smallpox and half a dozen others led a doctor visiting Charleston in the 1780s to give this postmortem. Carolina was in the spring a paradise, in the summer a hell, and in the autumn a hospital. In the cities, there was the added violence of the police state constructed to keep the enslaved population in line. Um, these images are of what um, um, uh, the scholar Maury McGinnis, his art historian, uh, refers to as the landscapes of correction of Charleston. The jail, which is at the top, 
The jail was part of a complex that included the workhouse, which was ironically referred to as the sugar house. Uh, people who were too squeamish to beat their own slaves would send them to the workhouse to, for a little bit of sugar, was the local euphemism. And one of the forms of torture that was employed was the treadmill at bottom right, which was, you know, well, we've all like worked a treadmill, like in the gym. Well, imagine doing that for days at a time, grinding corn and being whipped if you fell behind. So that was the, you know, the landscape against which all of this uh, is taking place and which is being made to vanish by these beautiful words and these gorgeous images. I want to share one last uh, image sort of taking us back to Africa to talk about mortality. This is uh, the slave castle at Elmina Island in Ghana, Ghana, sorry, and it left the door of no return. Um, these have now, for, for many years, for many decades, Africa was very ashamed of the slave castles. They have been reclaimed and turned into museums and people are now learning about the role that they played in uh, the slave trade on that side uh, of the Atlantic. And um, so sobering as the picture that I painted of uh, back in of what was going on back in the United States, sobering as this is, we must also not forget the subtler, yet no less devastating dying that was not physical but spiritual. The massive commingling of cultures and extinction of languages that occurred as slave sellers and buyers forced together people of different backgrounds to lessen the likelihood that they'd make common cause and run away. But let's try to imagine it, to imagine the African captives not just as a collection of, you know, just as a sort of monolithic mass. These included Mandinkins who were remarkable for their height and beauty, short-statured Evos shunned by Carolina planters for their alleged propensities to rebellion and suicide, they were slaves, they were kings, they were warriors, they were priests, they were skilled craftsmen, peasant farmers, they were Muslims, there were Christians. The Congo was a Christian nation. There were pagans, of course, from hundreds of diff distinct grip groupings. And they all, all imagined hundreds of, uh, uh, spoke hundreds of languages. Songhai, Wolof, Fulani, Temne, Kisi, Gola, Mende, Kru, Iwi, Twi, Yoruba, Igbo, Bantu, Congo, to name just a few. And let's imagine, just reflect for just a moment on the fact that not a single one of these languages survived intact. Right? So all we have are these remnants that exist in English. Okra, gumbo, you know, many of the hip cat, jive, some of these many languages that we think are just sort of southernisms or Englishisms, these are the remnants of Gullah and of West African languages that, that just remain with us. But along with uh, that loss, there was one singular locus of survival, of healing, and that was the slave's music. So I'm going to play you um, a rendition of Been in the Storm So Long. Maybe. <laughs>
So um, music was the salvation of the souls of the enslaved. It was the one thing that they could carry with them on those slave ships, right? There were no pockets, you know, there were no suitcases. But their cultural knowledge, their songs, was something that they brought with them. And when this enslaved chose to convert to Christianity, the specific manifestation of their religion became the music we call today the spirituals. Uh, this image is called uh, the old, I should say, point out, is the old plantation, uh, painted in the 1700s and believed to depict a Beaufort, South Carolina plantation. Um, the music was frequently mischaracterized and misunderstood. Fortunately, we have the slave narratives to help orient us to the context in which they develop and the worldview that they expressed. Uh, this is Alauda Echiano, uh, uh, whose narrative, the interesting narrative of the life of Alauda Echiano or Gustavus Vaza, the African written by himself in 1789, says, we are almost a nation of dancers, musicians, and poets. Every great event, such as a triumphant return from battle or other cause of public celebration, is celebrated in public dances and music suited to the occasion. Each represents some interesting scene of real life, such as a great achievement, a domestic employment, a pathetic story, or some rural sport. And as the subject is generally founded on some recent event, it is therefore ever new. The same aesthetic governs the songs sung by the enslaved and also sung by African Americans today. Whether it's, you know, we're talking about been in the storm so long or we're talking about, you know, um, that Becky has a, you know, Becky has a baby by Tupac Shakur. They're telling the news as it's unfolding in front of them, right? Um, a lot of Ekiano being from Dahomey, from the Kingdom of Benin. This is Frederick Douglass. Um, he says, the slaves would make the dense woods for miles around reverberate with their wild songs, revealing at once the highest joy and the deepest sadness. They'd sometimes sing the most pathetic sentiment in the most rapturous tone and the most rapturous sentiment in the most pathetic tone. I did not, when a slave, understand the deep meaning of these rude and apparently incoherent songs. I was myself within the circle. But later on, upon reflection, he has realized every tone was a testimony against slavery and a prayer to God for deliverance from chains. Let's see. <laughs> This is a song called Lay Down Body by the Mackinac County Singers. And so this is a song that's about lay down body, just lay down a little while, just give me a little rest, give me a little time, you know? But it's a happy song, right? You can get up and dance to it. So this is a sort of, you know, reflection of that that um, thing that that, um, that Douglas points out. <coughs> um, for Du Bois, uh, who, and so now we're going to get to our three, our three uh, observers, our three 1920s and 1930s observers of of of, of the um, of the spirituals. For Du Bois, uh, who at for a time was a, um, uh, a professor at Atlantic University and uh, at the AU complex, as they called it at those time, in, in those times, and also um, a sociologist doing studies, sociological studies of the Negro. Uh, he's really the pioneer of the sociological method. And so uh, he's, he's important in so many fields, not just history, but also in sociology. So Du Bois had traveled the length and breadth of coastal Georgia during these studies that he was taking. And the artists and critics of the New Negro Renaissance influenced by his thinking, for them, the, uh, the spirituals were evidence both of the Negro race's gift for the world and also um, of talented tenth achievement, as, um, you know, uh, as, as Du Bois phrased it in the triumphal tours of the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Du Bois had argued that um, the Negro had, quote, a particular message, a particular ideal, which shall help to guide the world nearer and nearer the perfection of human life 
for which we all long. He said um, in, in the Sorrow Songs, in the, the, the Souls of Black Books, he links this moment with uh, a moment of fatal encounter set in the heart of the Gullah Geechee Coast when Thomas Wentworth Higginson, Colonel, uh, Colonel of the Black First South Carolina Volunteers during the Civil War, came from Boston, arrived in South Carolina, and described hearing the songs for the first time. Right, so here's a couple of images of the Port Royal experiment, African-American soldier posing with slaves on Hilton Head Island, a northern school marm, an African-American teacher, and students at the Penn School. This is this moment of fateful encounter that Higginson is talking about. Uh, in wartime came the singular Port Royal experiment after the capture of Hilton Head, and perhaps for the first time, the North met the Southern slave face to face and heart to heart with no third witness. The sea islands of the Carolinas where they met were filled with a black folk of the primitive type, touched and molded less by the world about them than any others outside the black belt. Their appearance was uncouth, their language funny, but their hearts were human and their singing stirred men with a mighty power. So Du Bois links the provenance of the spirituals to Thomas Wentworth Higginson, to Lucy McKim, uh, who uh, is the author of Slave Songs of the South, uh, the first collection of slave songs in 1867. <coughs> the white southerner is completely written out of the story, right? It's white northerners who discovered the, the, the hymns and brought them to the world. Well, let's hear a little bit. Let me go forward. I think this one, yeah. Um, so, and then he also puts the Fisk Jubilee singers into the, into the picture. Many of these Fisk Jubilee singers uh, were, you know, uh, uh, enslaved, or only one generation removed from enslavement. But this is the way they sung the songs. Oops, sorry. Let's start from the beginning. No, sorry, backwards. What are you doing? This has been in the song Storm So Long. The same song we just heard a minute ago. This is talented tenth achievement is linking uh, and, and this uh, sort of provenance going through northern uh, philanthropists and, uh, and you know, sort of right thinking northern people. That's Du Bois on the one hand. Of course, Du Bois is from Boston, you know, so uh, he, that's the home of the northern school bar. Of course, he's going to link it with that. On the other hand, um, the uh, uh, southerners in the Charleston Renaissance are seeing this as uh, evidence of the contented slave. Uh, and this is what Herbert Ravenel Sass says in that same essay that I quoted from earlier. Out of the life that was lived on the plantations came the Negro as we know him now in Lower Carolina, one of the happiest of mortals to be found anywhere on earth. Out of that life came the fine and significant fact that here there is no race problem, but on the contrary, much warm affection and mutual respect. Out of that life came the beautiful songs, the spirituals, which belong to neither race, but to both races, and which are recognized now as so important a part of, so important a part of American folklore. So that's kind of fascinating. <laughs> so that's a way of kind of claiming it, the, the sort of, it, we're sort of like kind of removing the Negro from the equation. Um, 
the, the songs don't belong to either race, but to both races. So of course, we're the ones who are in the right position to tell you what they actually mean. I'm sorry. So this is the book that, that, um, that appears in the Carolina Low Country, uh, published in 1931. There might even be a copy in this library. Um, and you can see the sort of, this is a, another image, one of Alice Ravenel, um, um, Hugh G. Smith's uh, landscapes that is on the frontispiece, but it's, you know, many of the images from her Rice series are included in that also. Um, so one of the things that's most important to note is that the collaborators use this project to erect a wall of personal legitimacy around the Gullah spirituals and to sort of tell people what the spirituals mean. And what they mean is, I just want to give you a slide about what the slave master's religion consisted of. Basically, the slave master's religion consisted of obey your master. <laughs> slave servants obey your masters, right? And also, don't steal your master's hog. Don't steal your master's corn. That was sort of like the, the slave catechism and the slave religion that was passed on. This is a quote from Rabateau's Slave Religion in which um, a former, uh, it's taken from the slave narratives in which a former slave is sort of basically saying, this is what we were taught by the white pastors who came to preach to us. We know, however, that the slaves, uh, there's no recognition that the slaves intentionally um, you know, uh, misled the master class, right? Got one mind for the master to see, got another for what I know is me. That's one of, that's a line from a song. Um, nor is there the faintest awareness that given the prevalence of Muslims, uh, Christian Congos, um, and um, among the Gullah Geechee population, that people actually were already people of the book and had, were positioned to create their own oppositional readings of the Bible. So these are some of the oppositional meanings of the coded language of the spirituals. Let's see. So that brings us to this one. There has never been a presentation of genuine Negro spirituals anywhere. Um, so declaring a pox on both their houses is Zora Neale Hurston, who seems she is violently disagrees with the, prem the whole premise of the souls of black folks. She does not believe that the, the songs are sorrow songs. Sometimes she believes that they, rep they, they express sorrow, but they express a range of emotions for her. The most important thing, um, she had total disdain, not for the talented 10th presentations of the spirituals, but for the idea that these would be mistaken for spirituals. Because it was Zora Neale Hurston's, uh, she, her interest as an anthropologist, she was the first uh, uh, literary artist who had anthropological training. And so she brought an anthropologist's eye to her, um, to her creative writing, and she brought um, a literary flair to her anthropological writing, which led to her being rejected on both sides, right? <laughs> right? The, the, the literary people were like, why are you talking about these, you know, these illiterate people from the bottom of society? We want to talk about the talented tenth. And the anthropologists were like, what are you doing making this stuff humorous and entertaining to read? You're you know, <laughs> taking away from the seriousness of our enterprise. So she was constantly in trouble with both sides. Um, so it, interestingly though, even she see, the, though she seems to be uh, taking the side of the Charleston Renaissance, she is in fact bringing her own um, uh, trained eye to understanding what's going on with the spirituals. Uh, let's see. Uh, she's a folklorist who's been documenting the Afro-Creole roots of Southern culture to achieve her vision of the real black theater for the better part of a decade when she writes uh, her work uh, on, on the spirituals. So she's sure of her ground. Um, she says real spirituals as opposed to neo-spirituals are never sung solo or in quartets, but always in groups. The harmonies are jagged, not regular. The dissonances are important and not to be ironed out by the trained musician. You can see the ways in which the, the, the trained the, uh, version of Been in the Storm So Long is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous, but it's not the same thing. And Zora wanted to make sure to give 
those, uh, the people at the bottom of the society, uh, as it was called back in those days, the Negro lowest down, the full credit for their creativity and to understand that creativity on its own terms. So, to close things out, <laughs> these are the sort of three sides in the debate that I have, um, uh, that I presented to you. It's a fascinating story to sort of like look at the ways in which these different groups are contesting and, you know, for the ownership of the spirituals and for the right to tell the story about the spirituals. And if you want to know more about it, then I would love it if you would buy my book. <laughs> but I'll end with one last song and then questions. I think we have time for questions, even though I've talked forever, it seems like. <laughs> Sorry, those were the uh, Georgia Sea Island singers co uh, collected by um, Alan Lomax back in the 1940s. So I like that one because it shows the use of, uh, of a very African style of drumming and, and fife um, that one sees in, in the actual, you know, sort of like the ones that you get from the original source. So uh, questions? And I guess we should bring the lights up. Yeah, oh, yes, I'm sorry, this hand first and then this, this lady. Thank you. Um, with all the different languages, and how, how did they communicate when they got to, the, to the, their, their plantation? That's an excellent question. So think about the fact that if you, I don't know if you know any African people today or people who are from um, you know, other parts, they speak like seven languages, right? So they knew each other's languages, right? And so... And the other thing is that there was already in, in existence um, a trade language that people you know, who were from different parts of the continent could sort of like fall back on to do you know, trading, to like buy and sell. So that becomes a sort of like framework upon which all these other languages get grafted, including English, right? So we've ended up with uh, a situation in which the Gullah language has mostly uh, English vocabulary, but the syntactical structures, the ways in, and the ways in which verb tenses, you know, the, the verb tense sticks into does not exist in English. You know, if you talk to people in, you know, in in in, in London, they don't have that, you know, fix into or he be gone or he. So that sounds like ungrammatical English, but what it really actually tells you is the aspect of completion. How complete is the action? is the action uh, habitual. So these are actually verb tenses that exist in other languages, just not in the European language structures that is part of the other heritage of people who live in the United States. So part of it is all this stuff gets grafted, and the other part is the erosion of, of African words is because we no longer live in that world. The African words were used to describe um, the work that people did in the rice fields, and they were used to describe the natural world. Well, we live in, you know, suburbs, so there's no use for those language, those, those words anymore, so that's why they eroded out of use. Um, just so now that it's a, you know, there's a, an accent and there's a syntactical structure that's a little bit different, um, sometimes very different depending on, you know, uh, the age of the informant, you know, the, the person who is talking. But, but yeah, that's how they spoke to each other and that's how Gullah has sort of like turned into, it's a post-Creole language as opposed to a Creole language now. So they came over having some continuity between their languages. Mm -hmm. okay. So some of them are, um, there's, a, there's a, a wonderful slide that I didn't put in here, uh, but that shows a sort of like broad language continuities. So Bantu languages take up a huge section of Central Africa. And so people who are like along the fringes, who don't speak other languages, they all do the Bantu languages. And vice versa, the people on the edges of the Bantu territory who like, you know, were, uh, you know, next to Dahomey, where they spoke something different, 
They knew those languages too. So they knew, they were familiar with each So this idea that if you mingle people together, that they wouldn't be able to communicate was, it was kind of like wishful thinking, more, <laughs> more than anything else. It doesn't, you, you know, under conditions of that kind of exigency, it doesn't take people too much time to figure out how to, you know, mm -hmm. how, to get, how, to, how to talk to each other. And the other thing that we should remember is that, um, that for many white people, for a long, long period of time, Gullah was their first language too, right? Including elite white people. These people who grew up on the plantations and sang the spirituals, well, I've heard recordings, and you know, you can't tell the difference. I did a, I did a, um, if you, unless you know who's singing, you can't tell the difference between the Society for the Preservation of Spirituals and the Macintosh singers. You really can't. So, Gullah was their first language. And that was sort of like their claim to authenticity, and also their claim to being you know, we, that's how they kind of established. We had the real connection to the plantations. The rest of you guys are just pretenders, right? <laughs> so it can be used in a lot of different directions, right? Yes, ma'am, you had a question. Does the Society for the Preservation Yes, still it still exists, exists. yeah. It still exists. It still exists, and in fact, I went to high school with one of the girls who, um, who is a descendant, and that's how I got my, my copy of the, uh, <laughs> of the, the the, the, the recordings, so. But of course, the ones, the recordings were made like in the 1980s, they don't sound anything like the ones that were made in the 1940s, so there's been an erosion do of color language. Do they perform? No, I think that they are, I don't know what they do now. <laughs> I think it's just a social group, you know, like so many Charleston social groups, right? But they don't perform now. <laughs> Yes, I, I was get the guy in the back and then. I was a little shocked when you said that the mortality rate for for rice workers was so high. Um, I didn't realize that you know because you know well, you're you know you're working it up up to your knees yeah. in water most of the year, right? So people you know get especially they would get lung diseases. And, um, you know, or if you had any kind of a scratch or any, you know, kind of like cut and you're in that water, then you develop infections. So, but for the children, it was malaria. So there was this um, myth that, uh, so all the white people stayed in Charleston or in Savannah, or, you know, or they went off to, you know, Flat Rock or, you know, someplace up north, um, Saratoga, you know, whatever, um, because it was fatal. In the, the, because they, if they caught malaria, it was fatal. They didn't have any um, resistance to it, just like the Native Americans didn't have any resistance to smallpox. So they stayed away. And the myth was that the black people who were, well, it was fine for the slaves to do it because they were immune. No. If you survive to adulthood, then you have resistance to malaria, right? Yeah. But all, there were so many people who did not survive to adulthood. No, the infant mortality and the youth mortality was just, it was crazy. Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned that many or some of the uh, people coming from the Congo were Christians. Yes. So they presumably had European uh, Well, they were Catholics. They were Catholics. Okay. So the Congo, remember the Portuguese are the first people okay to start the slave trade. And they start trading in the Christian kingdom of the Congo. They had this myth of Prester John. You guys have heard of that myth, that Prester John was a Christian king who was like somewhere in Central Africa. And you know he had all these gold and all this gold and riches. And so people were like wandering around Central Africa in like the 1500s trying to find Prester John. But the actual um, kingdom of the Congo was established um, it, there was a biracial ruling majority that was half Portuguese, half African, and a, a large number of people, that, that was the ruling class in Congo. And then, you know, uh, a large portion of all the elites in the society were also Catholic. So, so well, when, they, when they get to South Carolina coast, it seems that, uh, how, did, how did they, how did, I don't know how to explain this, how did the actual spiritual part of the spirituals get a toehold? 
I mean, so, they weren't already re religious when they got Now, here. that all happens you know, here in the United States. Yeah. So nobody in, in, they are singing whatever songs they sing in the Congo, right, in, in, the, in those uh, Christian churches. I, I, so. But the observance that develops here in the United States, people are, um, uh, uh, is happening in what we call the praise houses, which are these brush arbor communities. People go way out into the forest, and they are doing ring shouts. And uh, the ring shout is, uh, it's, uh, it's a counterclockwise dance, but they don't call it a dance. As long as you don't cross your feet, it's not dancing, right? Because dancing is wrong according to Christianity, right? So, but they're using, they're using their African drumming, they're using their African ry rhythms, they're using their African tunes, and they're grafting uh, Christian words and concepts onto that. So that um, is developing here in the United States. And that gets spread out to the rest of the population during the Great Awakening, where the Methodist preachers go in and they're like, we're going to preach the gospel to you. Uh, we're going to preach the gospel to you regardless of your background, whether you're white or you're black or, you know, whatever. And so people come together in these huge revivals and they start swapping songs. And the slaves' songs get, you know, um, introduced to the uh, Appalachian ballads. And all of that gets mingled together, right, and, and turned. But the, there's a distinctive spot, style of spirituals that's associated with the South Carolina Low Country. And that's because of all, this is such a heavily, this is really one of the places where you could say that, you know, black people, black culture began in the United States because more people were imported through the, the port of Charleston than any other port, you know, in, um, in, in the United States. The port of New Orleans is, uh, is the only thing that even comes close as a second. And so this is a huge cauldron in which black culture gets created. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. And just a comment, um, it, 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 I think your translations up there of words and their real meanings, I, it, it was probably really valuable because of so many double meanings of these wonderful songs. Um, so right, what so they were saying was acceptable to their, you know, their masters when in effect they were, they were saying something totally different and opposite. So, and this might be, have been something that I rushed through, but one of the things that they said in the Carolina Low Country was that there was no, you know, that, there, that when, the, when the slaves sang about um, slavery, they meant spiritual slavery. There was no political content and there was no contemporary commentary on society um, in the spirituals. It was purely about religion. And that was their whole thesis. They spent, built up to this whole book to, to say that, no, they weren't complaining, they were happy, right? And you know, we know, you know, African American people know, come on, got one mind for me and another mind for the master to see. Mm -hmm. Well, it looked to me like on that one slide that um, it was almost a code, some of the songs. That, yes. That it is a code, right. They're communicating with each other in plain sight. Right. Right? The, because the, you know, the, the, it's, it's the same kind of like, um, it's the same kind of logic that allowed um, an African-American woman to operate as a, a spy in the Confederate White House. You know, people would be talking about military plans, leaving things out, and she would just, you know, get out a piece of paper and draw up the plans, you know, stick it in her, you know, in her bodice, go about her business, and then when she went to the hospital to deliver, you know, whatever supplies, then she'd pass it along <laughs> to the next person in the spy ring because they assumed these people were stupid. That, uh, that, the, that the ways in which the kind of obeisance and the obsequiousness that they displayed was their actual, you know, the servility that they uh, displayed to their faces was the way they actually felt. Mm -hmm. uh, just to add on to that, you, you look at, well, when I, I look at these extraordinarily beautifully built, I love architecture, these beautifully built homes, and also these beautifully designed rice plantations, and they were all built and designed and run by black slaves. 
And the, but the that's, they don't get credit for that. <laughs> they're, they're, no, they don't. Yeah, they don't get credit for that. Yeah, because, I mean, you can understand the importance of kind of defending yourself psychologically from the implications, the full implications of what you're doing. These people have to be subhuman, otherwise you're a monster, right? right? So, you, so that's where so much of this comes from. And the fact that people are still so in, invested in defending, you know, um, this worldview is the, is the thing that I think should surprise us more than anything, because it was back then. None of us is personally responsible for anything that happened back then. We're only responsible for what we know now and what we do now. But some people would rather just, you know, shut it all down and not know anything. Well, you know, we, there's been a lot of controversy, <clears throat> obviously, about this kind of related to that, but about the uh, plantations and plantation tours and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, what, how would you, um, what would you sort of recommend or suggest uh, going forward to maybe uh, correct the history there? Well, I think that, um, I mean, I, I don't know, I, when I was um, in graduate school, I worked at Monticello um, oh. for a, a good while, and, and my husband was the, what, was the head horticulturist at Monticello. Mm -hmm. Uh, for, and so I think that uh, I worked with a number of people at, who were at Colonial Williamsburg, Monticello, Montpelier. Who, that's why I said, you know, we've always been embedded in place. You know, the work that I did has always been embedded in place. I think that there are people who are doing really great history. And as long as you are embedding the history that you're doing in place in the actual records that, you know, there are so many extant records that tell you who the people were, what they did, what actually happened. Those stories are so much more interesting. It's funny. So what you, what you hear so many times is that people wanted to sort of dismiss the whole thing by saying, um, well, so-and-so was a man of his time or something like that. And the fact of the matter is that if you investigate what those times were, they were so much more interesting than anything that you could possibly come up with. Um, and so this is a way to avoid thinking, right? So we don't, we, and we should not want to avoid thinking. We should always want to, to think our way through what people of the past were going through. Not so that we can judge it, but so that we can kind of like navigate the present better and maybe imagine um, a better future. So people get so hung up on whether or not, you know, you think, um, you know, Thomas Jefferson was a bad person. I think that's like the least interesting question right. about Thomas Jefferson, right? Thomas Jefferson was a spendthrift who died like a million dollars in debt and hung that debt around his children, his, and gra his children and grandchildren's neck for like generations. They spent, his grandson spent his entire like life paying off his grandson and his grandfather's debts. I think that's a lot more interesting than whether or not he was a bad person, right? So there, if you know these things about um, the past, then we can ask ourselves more interesting questions, especially about what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. So that's what I, I think that um, I remember when you couldn't, you would not hear the word slave spoken on a house or a plantation tour in, in, in South Carolina. I remember when um, uh, Jamaica Kincaid, who's a really, really fine uh, Caribbean writer, uh, who w is, was married to the son of the editor of The New Yorker, so it probably wasn't a good idea to offend her, you know, <laughs> went to um, Middleton Place uh, Plantation to, to give a talk, and she mentioned slavery, and the person who was the head of the Middleton Foundation basically came up to her afterwards, the Conservancy came up after her afterwards and, and screamed at her, you know, that she had just destroyed the blah, blah, blah. And of course, she wrote about it in the New Yorker, yeah. right? <laughs> so, so everybody knew. So yeah, you don't necessarily want to do that. So that, but that, and that was in 2000. So I remember when Nigel Redden got fired from the Spoleto Festival because he did a series of 
art installations that talked about race in Charleston, and nobody was ready for that, right? Of course, the, of course and so Giancarlo Monotti took, took it over for about 10 years and ran it into the ground financially, and they had to bring um, you know, Nigel Redden back. Actually, it was in 1994, and they brought him back in 2000. But, but yeah, I remember, and that that's, time seems to have passed, though there are people who seem to want to bring it back. But um, I think that the conversations that are being had uh, uh, at, at many uh, plantations and ha historic houses are uh, at a much higher level than they've ever been because people are actually looking at what the records tell them about everybody who lived there, not just about, you know, um, the wallpaper, you know, <laughs> or the sideboard, <laughs> or, or the colors that people, you know, paint in their houses. You know, it's, it's plantations shouldn't be places you go for decorating tips, right? They should really be places where we go to, you know, talk about stuff that's important. Yeah, that's important, right? And I think that's happening, you know. Mm -hmm. Just a comment about education. I just think that that's significantly the most important thing that we go through and when we try to suppress education, which we did in America for the longest time, we were, and still are in many ways, destroying the, the real value of, of who we are and what we can become. You won't have anything to add to that. <laughs> Well, anyway, um, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. It was lovely, and I hope you will have me back when there's actually yeah. something to hold in oh, one's yeah. hand. Yeah, I think. Thank you. Yeah. I think, I think you've, you've sold, pre sold some coffees already. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to the full story. Thank you so much, Dr. Kendra Hamilton. Thank you very much. Thank you.